Ziggy, a busy day for the Sounders at the MLS Super Draft on Thursday. You guys swapped that number 15 pick overall in the first round um, for a defender from the fire, Kevin Jones, who I think is probably a potential starter for you guys right out of the gate. What do you think? Yeah, you know, obviously he, he's a left back. You know, he's played for Trinidad's national team as well. A couple of times he's played, uh, you know, left midfield. I think uh, in terms of pace, very similar to a DeAndre Yedlin uh, type of guy, but on the other side of the field, uh, natural lefty. Uh, obviously Dylan Remick is coming back, you know, so Dylan's a guy who can play there as well. Jones can play there. Jones can play in front of him. Uh, so that could be a good combination or, or we let him battle it out. But uh, Joven definitely uh, increases our possibilities on the left-hand side and is a person that's going to compete uh, and, and to get on the field right away. What does it mean for O'Neill Fisher, a guy who sort of carried the load on the left side down the stretch for you? He might have the versatility to go even on the right side at some point. Yeah, O'Neill uh, uh, you know, is a great player and we have a lot of high hopes for him. And uh, so O'Neill is a guy who's probably his best position is right back. His second best position is left back. So we're getting him back over to his best position. But when you look at the uh, four guys right now, they're competing out for outside back. Now you've got 24 year old, a 24 year old, a 25 year old and, and Tyrone Mears is the elder statesman. But you know, one of the things we talked about is, is starting to get our team a little bit younger uh, as we move forward. And uh, certainly that that gives us uh, uh, a good amount of youth at the outside back positions and, and bodes well for the future. Added some depth on the back line at center back as well in the second round with a kid named Tony Alfaro, a left-footed guy who evidently performed pretty well in the combine from all accounts. What do you make of this kid out of um, Cal State Dominguez Hills? Yeah, Tony, we think, is a good player. He's a little bit uh, uh, of a sleeper in, in our eyes because he played for a Division II school, so a lot of people didn't know him. Uh, but uh, he's a player we think is solid. You know, I mean, his head coach at his school is a guy I've known for a while, same guy, you know, that helped, helped produce Kai Kamara. You know, basically Joe Flanagan is excellent at that. Uh, but he's something different than the center backs we have. He's left-footed. His strength is probably playing the ball out of the back, passing the ball out of the back. So that's something that, uh, that we liked. Uh, he could probably slip in and play outside back as well if we wanted to give him a go there. Uh, but he's got good size. He's a good header of the ball. And, uh, and he's a guy who likes to organize and likes to talk. And, and so the opportunity is going to get presented to him is something that he's, he's very, very much appreciative of. And as we scouted him, Kurt had scouted him, had saw good things on him. We sent Brian Schmetzer down to watch him in a game as well. He was really impressed. Uh, I don't think he had the best combine. Uh, but we want to look at the body of his work, and the body of his work is really good. Last pick of the day went to Zach Mathers, a kid who was pretty versatile for Duke. I think he was a four-year starter for them. Played on the back line or in sort of defensive midfielder role and then played a little more attacking as a senior. Where do you see him fitting in once preseason opens up uh, later this month? Uh, he helps us with our midfield depth. You know, I think he's a, he's a good, solid midfielder. He's got a good work rate in, in terms of covering ground. Uh, what I really like about him is, is, is his passing. You know, one of the qualities that Eric Freeberg brings is his ability sometimes to hit that first-time ball and find people forward. Zach sort of has that same ability uh, where he seems to find guys forward with early balls and, uh, and is able to deliver that ball pretty good. His range of passing is good, you know, short and long. So, so we're excited about it. You know, he comes out of a good program uh, as well. Duke's a solid program. You know, gives Garth a Duke guy on the team. We needed that for Garth. And, uh, you know, but it's it, it's good. You know, obviously we thought he was a good player. We had him much higher on our list. Uh, you know, he's a guy that we had in our in our top 20. Uh, you know, so for, if you look at it, Alfaro was high on our list. So when you look at it in the second round, you're able to get two guys that were on our top 20 list. You know, we feel pretty good about that. Really quickly to, to wrap up, your final thoughts on this draft. I think this is one of those formative years where we're going to start to see the college draft change a little bit more because so much of the talent is now homegrown and you're starting to see clubs trade these picks for allocation money and targeted allocation money. What, what's the draft's role going forward for you as a head coach and how do you use the draft to shore up your, your club? Yeah, well, I, I think this draft was a little bit unique. You know, you know, one, it was unique because I think it's the first draft where, as you mentioned, the homegrowns really weren't involved. And, and so when you look at it, there was probably maybe 15, 20 players who would have been here in the combine if, if the homegrown rule didn't exist. So that was one factor. But the other thing that made this draft unique is the value of money because of the tightness of everybody's budget for next year. Uh, so, so with the cap being what it is, you know, with town money now being in play as well as allocation money, uh, I think everybody, uh, everybody's top priority or a lot of people's top priority uh, was uh, just to gather money so they could 
make it through next season. Uh, you know, that's something as we move forward, you know, might change and give a little more value to the players coming out. But I think that's why you saw so many trades and so much movement is because of the fact that teams were able to load up on a little bit of money, which they desperately needed to get cap compliant.